Welcome to Core Concepts. This is, as you know, if you've been watching or coming to uh, the Renford Broadcast Network on YouTube.com, this is a situation where we ask religious and spiritual leaders, and sometimes people who are kind of irreligious, <laughs> to come tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. In other words, how did they come to their belief system, and how's it manifesting in their lives? This show is sponsored by the Institute of Applied Metaphysics and One Community. It's also, we're also this uh, f uh, at present at the Temple of the Sacred Gift, and uh, they're our sponsors during this period as well. So we appreciate you being with us. Our guest today is L. McDonald, and L. is has an extraordinary story in her path and. Um, I, I really wanted her to come and tell you about it because it is so unusual. She comes from a, a little town in Arkansas, Conway, Arkansas. Conway, Arkansas. And, right. and has spent uh, more than 15 years in Africa and gone through special training there. And um, she's, the, she's an author. She's got, uh, this is, are you too emotional or are you emotional enough? And then there's five books, you correct me on my pronunciation, and the Mist of the Ancestors, Energy, uh, Anatomy, Coloring Book, Are You Dreaming Your Life, or uh, Are You, uh, or Is Your Life Dreaming You, uh, Spirit Animals of Africa, and uh, Stress Ace Yoga. She is a yoga teacher, and a teacher of more than that, I, I think. So would you want to tell us a little bit about how in the world you got to Africa and then ended up spending 15 years there mm. in a mud hut? In a mud hut. <laughs> well, the whole 15 years wasn't in a total in the mud hut. But um, my journey is probably similar to a lot of people's journey. Uh, the main thing that took me to Africa is I became very ill and my stress levels were very high. And uh, I noticed, um, I was reading some articles and some magazines and things that a lot of people these days are coming down with autoimmune diseases, chronic fatigue, Epstein-Barr, fibromyalgia. Well, when the, all this was happening to me, there were no names for these conditions, but now um, it's a plethora of people that are not feeling well. And through my journey of my life and uh, my search uh, to, for wholeness, um, I had gone to a lot of doctors, a lot of medical doctors, a lot of psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, hypnotherapists, um, various and sundry alternative healing sessions, and no one could help me. And I got to the point where I couldn't get out of bed. Now, I was raised in a very small town of 15,000, Conway, Arkansas, at that time, but now I think it's like 200,000, so that's how long ago that's been. And um, I come from a typical southern dysfunctional family, which is, I think a lot of us come from those. I don't think that's anything unusual. But I was born a healthy child and felt that life should be much easier than um, struggling and being in trouble all the time and not getting approval or being in church. So um, my journey started very early in life. I knew I wanted to help people. My grandfather was a um, medical doctor. He um, served his little community. My father was also a man of herbs and uh, he did a lot of research on treating himself with through diet and that sort of thing. So I was drawn into the medical profession quite early. I graduated high school and uh, went to the big city of Little Rock uh, and went to nursing school. And uh, I thought I was going to I was getting into a profession that was going to be helping and um, made me feel like I would be directed in life. Well, I found out in nursing, um, you weren't allowed to connect with people emotionally, that 
everyone was referred to as the heart patient down the hall or the gallbladder down the hall. And everybody had a diagnosis. So there was, there was something missing in that whole arena for me. So um, I used my nursing degree to put myself through college. At that time, um, nurses were uh, in the hospital. It was a four-year degree. And um, so I put myself through college and started studying psychology. Uh, the word psychology means uh, psych is soul, and ology means to study, to study the soul. So I thought, ah, oh, this is for me. This is, this, I'm on the right track now. So <clears throat> I became a psychologist. Um, I didn't do it all in one linear fashion. I started and went and started and went. And in one of my um, starts and stops, I became uh, interested in money because I wasn't earning very much money. So I became a stockbroker. And in becoming a stockbroker on Wall Street, um, I became um, incredibly focused on prestige and money, and uh, the pressures were tremendous. So in the long run and looking back on it, um, I was mostly um, just wanting to make money. And I did end up making money and reaching financial goals, but I had a very high price that I paid with my health, because one day I could not get out of bed. And when that happened, that's when I started for my search, like, okay, I'm a nurse, I'm a psychologist, um, surely these professions can help me. Well, they couldn't. So thus I started my journey on trying to heal myself. Um, they wanted to um, give me medication, uh, put me in therapy, put me in uh, mental institutions, that sort of thing. And I knew, I, I mean, I remember that there was something wrong with this picture. So I started traveling and looking at other cultures, looking at other ways to be in the world, and my indoctrination of the world, um, which is cultural. I was um, looking for a different culture. So um, I, um, my first journey uh, was to go to India. I went to India and uh, went to all the ashrams, and did all the meditations and the pilgrimage to the sacred sites, and it was wonderful. And while I was in India, I met a woman. Um, we were sitting in the temple, and in India, you sat very close to each other. In America, we're like, give me my space, but in India, they sat very much on top of each other. I was trying to make my way through the crowd. And um, I heard this English accent um, as I was going by. And she said, uh, excuse me, do you know anyone that gives massages? And I had just happened in all my other studies uh, become a massage therapist as well. So I said, well, yes, I do. And she said, uh, well, if you'll give me a massage, I'll teach you how to channel. And I had never been exposed to anything like that before. So this was in the early 90s. So I went with her and her friends to her um, room, and we exchanged. She taught me how to channel, and I gave her a massage, and she invited me back to her healing center in Glastonbury, England. And I went there, and um, she taught me how to channel. I got in touch with a lot of things that I never, in my wildest dreams, uh, thought I would ever know about, or hear about, or practice. And uh, while I was at one of those workshops that she gave, um, I met a man, uh, an Englishman, and I fell in love with him, and he fell in love with me. And um, we decided to travel to Tibet together, and we did. Got to visit all the monks and monasteries and uh, all those wonderful places in Tibet that not a lot of Americans, much less white people, have ever visited. And then we came back 
from that journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in computers, and um, so we decided he was invited by his company to move to South Africa to um, take a job there. So he said, "Would you like to go?" I said, "We're on a roll here. Let's keep going." So that's how I ended up in South Africa. That's a very long story and a long way around, but that's how I ended up in South Africa. And then while I was there, um, I uh, had developed a technique uh, that I took to South Africa. They had just come out of apartheid. Mandela had just been released a few years earlier. And so, I was able to share the technique that I was working with, which is what my book is based on, um, which is eye movement technology, working with stress and trauma. And um, we started our life there in South Africa. Uh, back in those days, uh, the United States was seen in very nice light. Uh, it was before Iraq. And so I was invited to do an interview on a, their major newspaper, and they came and did one. And about, um, and I was giving some free lectures at the time as well. About 500 people showed up to one of my lectures, and that's actually how I ended up spending so much time there, is that people just kept coming and wanting to know about the work that I was doing. <laughs> Glastonbury, uh, going back, you mentioned that. I've spent a little time there myself. This is a very uh, unique town in England, isn't it? It's, 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 the abbey is huge, and half of the houses there have got parts of it in it. I stayed in a place that the floor was had stones from the abbey. Yes. The legends are of King Arthur and, and being buried there, and all kinds of things. It's a very, and then it. It's like a new age shop all the way up and down and around the main street. It's very mysterious and very magical. And there's a lot of history there, a lot of violence, uh, the massacre of the monks um, in the abbey, the tour, a lot of hangings and brutal killings. Quite a walk up that tour. Yes. I lived right at the bottom of the tour, actually, in a little place called Shambhala. And the woman, back to the India, the uh, woman I met in India, her place was a healing center, and I met a lot of wonderful people from all over the world. I learned how to channel, I learned how to do Reiki, I learned uh, many, many things while living in Glastonbury. And it was a perfect place for me to be. I had dreams of King Arthur and Guinevere, and even went to the mythical area where they think um, Camelot mm -hmm. uh, was there. Yes. Visited Avery. Salisbury, um, what's the one with the big rocks? Um, Stonehenge. Stonehenge, yeah, we had some sacred ceremonies and things there. You walk up the, make that turn where the church is at the bottom there and the little hill that goes up mm -hmm. and all those little mm -hmm. shops and coffee shops and things, it's very bohemian, very... Uh, high, they call that very, High Street. Very high great. Street. It just was a very, very interesting yeah. place. And too. every year they have this wonderful Glastonbury Festival where musicians and all sorts of tradesmen and healers come from all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, um, lovely place. My time in England was really, really special. Now how did you get from uh, giving lectures to 500 people in South Africa to the mud hut. That's what everybody wants to know. <laughs> oh, I see. You're right. Okay. Let me back up a little bit. While I was in England, I think I told you I met this man, and we went to South Africa together. And then um, he uh, actually had a motorcycle accident while we were there and um, was killed. And so um, I was kind of left in South Africa on my own. At that time, I had no desire to come back. And um, so during my time there, um, I started seeing uh, people privately and working with them in, a, in the healing capacity that I knew at the time, which was the eye movement technology. Then I became, I, I was seeing so many people and um, a little bit overwhelmed, I became ill again. And um, that's when um, 
I started doing some more internal searching. Uh, I met a Sangoma. A Sangoma is the word, it means one who rides the drum or the shaman of Africa, from the African healing tradition. And uh, I went to see him in his hut because I was searching to feel better still. And um, he rolled the bones for me. And uh, when he rolled the bones, he spoke English, when he rolled the bones, one of the bones jumped in my lap and he started laughing. And I said, why are you laughing? He said, well, you've got the sickness of calling, the calling of the ancestors. So I said, well, what does that mean? And he says, it means you have to go live in the bush and live in a mud hut and train with my brother who lives up in Botswana. I was in South Africa at the time. So I um, said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I came back to um, the United States at that point. Um, I was pretty depressed and um, didn't, I kind of lost my direction, the loss of my friend, and uh, it was very disturbing to me, and it was very, very upsetting. So I came back to the States, and uh, when I came back, I started getting even sicker. Um, I tried practicing it as a stockbroker again. I tried practicing psychology again. I couldn't, it, I didn't have the energy and didn't want to do it. I was um, not sleeping. I was having dreams of Africa and snakes, and I woke up, would wake up with bites all over me, um, look like bug bites. And I was having dreams of these hordes of black people chasing me. And uh, so I called my friend uh, that lived there, who was South African, and said, I don't know what to do. I think I'd rather die than live like this. And he said, well, come back and we'll go and see the Sangoma. So I did. And I ended up doing what he said. I drove 1,500 miles to Botswana and surrendered to this process of becoming a Sangoma, which um, in the African healing tradition is a shaman, and you learn how to work with people in healing with herbs and dancing and rituals and song. And it was an amazing experience. And after six months, um, I was okay. I was feeling better. So it worked. <laughs> How long did it take to be uh, practicing Sangoma? Well, it's an ongoing process. Once you're a Sangoma, you're always a Sangoma. Um, but to grow up, so to speak, because you have to revert back to being a child and the Baba, the, the father that so, saw us every day, there was three of us, um, would raise us. We would go back and be reborn and be raised through our childhood development again. And uh, that took about uh, two years. Not all in the bush, because we would leave and come back. And then at the very end, we would have a coming home ceremony where everyone from the villages would be invited and we'd have food and drumming and dancing. And they could all look at the new children that were being born. So you, you did a Jonah. You ran away. And then you came back. Okay. And when you came back, how did he have you start? I mean, because they were that um, uh, we were talking about the, one of the rituals where you were covered and everything, and could tell us a little bit about that. Well, that was the beginning ritual. When um, this may uh, turn some of your stomachs, but when we got there, we had to let go of everything we knew. We our clothes, we were allowed to have a toothbrush, and we had to wear a uniform, which consisted of a hia, which is a wrap, and um, uh, it, it had to be specific colors. It was red and white and black. We wore white t-shirts and um, red skirts. Uh, we had to use ochre, which is a red clay, and they put 
that mixed with goat fat, uh, where it would stay in our hair. My hair was short at the time, which symbolized blood. Um, when you're being born, you wear blood on your head while you're still in the womb. So the first ceremony that we had, I had this goat fat and red ochre in my hair and my little costume, and I was scared. And we went into this mud hut, and all the people from the villages were there, and they were playing the drums, and there was fire, and people were chanting and singing, and they placed us under these blankets, uh, about 10 blankets, actually, and we had to stay there. And that represented being conceived and being in the womb. And we had to stay there until they said we could come out, but I was so disturbing to me. I kept peeking out underneath my blankets because I couldn't breathe. And um, it was extremely traumatic for me. And later, finding out from my mother after I talked to her, I also had a traumatic birth and I had to use forceps and uh, she was put it, uh, under with drugs. So it was um, pretty much a replay of my original birth. And then once you're out of the womb, then there's various uh, rituals that you go through depending on where you are in your child development um, stage. So that journey of uh, being born again was uh, ritualized to give us a fresh start, or they call it twaza. We were known as twazas, which means twice born. And then you had a series of adolescent I, I take it different stages that you went through? Yes, there were rituals for each stage that we went to. The Baba could look at us and tell how we were doing and how we were growing. Um, at the very end, we had graduation and we had homecoming, just like you do in this culture. Other Sangomas would come and they would teach us and we would go out into the mountains and the fields and hunt muti, which is plant medicines. And uh, they're extremely powerful. They did uh, things that in this culture we would consider um, backward or primitive, but when you're there, it works. Now you, uh, then you began to practice as a Sango. I did. I practiced for two years there in uh, Southern Africa in the Cape Town in Johannesburg area. I had a little hut in the back of my house. I bought a house there and I had a little hut. And uh, people came to see me and uh, I, was a, I was a doctor of witches, meaning um, there are people on the dark side there, and they're called witches, and um, you can hire them and pay them money, but we as Sangomas were witch doctors, meaning we were the doctor. People came to us that had been uh, hexed or cursed or harmed some way by the witches. So we, um, we were the uh, traditional African healers as Sangomas. Was there any reluctance on the part of the, we've got a visiting fly here who's yes. trying to <laughs> remind you of what Africa was like, right? Right. In the hut. Uh, but uh, we, had, we had scorpions, <laughs> not flies. Yeah. The, um, uh, was there any reluctance on the part of the locals to come to a, uh, a white Sangoma? Not at all. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, they were very excited to see me, and uh, they would come from all over to see me dance, and um, it was a, an incredible sense of belonging. They invited me to their homes, they would cook for me, have ceremonies. Sangomas are really well respected. Uh, when you're a new Sangoma, you wear beads around your neck and your wrists, and so the people can recognize you as a Sangoma. I would go to the grocery store and uh, the checkout people would ask me things or they would uh, um, ask if they could make an appointment. It was, uh, 
it was an amazing experience and I really had a sense of belonging and felt like I was doing the right thing for me at that time. Well, even though you've been through all of that and are a Sangoma, mm -hmm. your, real, your, your, your real background, and I should have introduced you as Dr. L. McDonald, not just L. McDonald, uh, you have your PhD and a lot of your research and everything else uh, is coming from a scientific background. How have you melded the Sangoma with the scientific background? Well, I'm not sure, I mean, who we are and what we are just is, so I'm not sure I've melded anything. What has happened is my journey in life has been rich and I've lived uh, an amazing um, life. My thing now is how do I apply it and assist the world and other people where I've been and not let it go to waste or not let it die uh, away. So that was one of my um, things for writing books is to try to get it on paper and people will recognize if this kind of story resonates with them or if it does not. It's my journey, it's no one else's journey. There are similar journeys, but what's interesting is I came back to the States in 2007 and uh, my mother had become ill and I decided it was time we had invaded Iraq and you know, it, it just, Americans weren't looked at very well anymore overseas. So it was time to come back, and when I came back, um, I started getting sick again, and not feeling well again. And I uh, was at a loss, I'm confused about, wow, you know, what do I do now? Well, another friend of mine said, um, let's go do some yoga, this particular kind of yoga called Kundalini Yoga, which is uh, breath, sound, and movement. And once I had done this yoga and realized the power of this yoga, I realized that everything I did in the bush was breath, sound, and movement. So I've been able to integrate Kundalini Yoga into my life. I became a certified Kundalini teacher I went and studied with Yogi Bhajan, who was the man that brought this uh, to the States. He passed in 2004. And since then, I've become certified in other yogas. And I've visited several different kinds of cultures. I've been to Tibet. I was in India. Um, all the indigenous, Australia, the indigenous cultures that I visited with use sound, breath, and movement to heal, to go into trance, to release stress. So now my journey has come about full circle and I have come up with my own yoga called Stress Ace Yoga. And I'm um, writing a book currently on this yoga. It uses sound, breath, movement. And we uh, release all stress and we build resilience and immunity to new stress. And we do this by um, teaching people how to do it on their own so that our nervous system doesn't get overwhelmed and built up through stress and living our lives. Now, when we discussed this before, uh, you talked about that part when you were born and that origin of that and why we have this kind of stress. Could you, could you relate that for our viewers, please? Yes. Um, we all come from a sperm and an egg. And the sperm and egg, when they um, join, they form uh, a few cells through mitosis and mitosis. And these few cells turn into what we call a neural tube. This neural tube is long and thin, 
And out of this neural tube, our nervous system, our brain, all of our organs, our heart, the cells of our body are created. This neural tube is sensitive. It's like an antenna. And everything that the mother goes through or the emotion she has is picked up by this neural tube. Our nervous system is like a recording device, just like the camera you're using to record this session. And it's done with the, what we call the reticular activating system. Now, I don't want to get too technical for you, but it's like a video recorder. So everything that we go in from the moment of our conception is recorded in our nervous system. And what we don't realize is our birth is also extremely traumatic. They used to hit babies when they were born to get them to breathe or shake them. And that's also very, very um, uh, traumatic to the nervous system. They're doing it a lot differently now, so that's really wonderful. But no matter what your childhood has been, whether you've had a wonderful childhood or whether you're from a dysfunctional family, all of us as human beings on the planet have a nervous system, and we've been recording things that have happened to us. And in this yoga that we've created, we are unwinding, unwinding events that are what we call precognitive, before we were thinking, and premotor, before we were moving out in the world. So preverbal, precognitive, and premotor, that's where the stress ice yoga starts unwinding our nervous system. And there's an authentic self, a self that we all have, that we can all get to once you learn how to unwind and you learn how to move through this, these things that are stored in our nervous system. For instance, in child development, we all start off as children with a primal brain, what they call the primal brain. And they talk about the uh, triune brain. The, the, the primal brain is about as an adult, it's about maybe as big as, half as big as your fist. And then over that is the mammalian brain. And then over that is the neocortex. So when you're a baby and a child, all you have is this primal brain, even though you may have tissue of the other brains, this primal brain is what's actually uh, activated. This keeps us breathing. It keeps us alive. It keeps us in fight, flight, or freeze. So this primal brain, as we're growing up, is totally activated and totally recording in its memory everything that's happened to us. When we get a little older, say past the age of three to five, then the mammalian brain and the emotional brain that uh, come, uh, is matured and kicks into gear, and then when we're at the age 25, we have the bigger brain, which is our neocortex and our higher, higher thinking facility. Uh, faculties. But in the beginning, all of us had this fight, flight, or freeze. And that's what we work with in the stress ice yoga. The first defense that we all have when we get in situations that we're not comfortable in is to fight or get angry. The second thing we do when we see we can't do anything is we want to run away. We get scared. And then the final thing we do, if we can't run away or fight, we freeze. Just like the possums do, and there's certain animals that just freeze up, like a deer in the headlights. We can't do anything, we feel helpless, we freeze up. All of that is recorded in our nervous system. Now you were talking about uh, fear being the base of all of our emotions the other day, and I was thinking about that, and I thought, Okay, I can see that. I can see love, fear, fear, love. But in a, on a physical level, when we're trying to survive, we're given three things that we can do. We can get angry and fight, or we can get fearful and run away, or we can freeze up. And those are the main things that most of us still do. We're still uh, reacting rather than responding. And when you get this base brain unwound, 
you get to the place where you can respond rather than react to people. And that's an amazing experience. Uh, at this stage of my own journey, I still react sometimes in situations that I'm not comfortable with, but there's a lot of times I can choose to respond in particular ways. It's not always that way yet, but I'm hoping someday I'll get there. <laughs> so I'm still working with it too. So your training program and your yoga really, mm -hmm. you go all the way back to the basics. You mm -hmm. know, so. Right. And now looking back on my journey to Africa, I think I was going back to basics to try to find, okay, where is this beautiful child that I was born? Well, what happened to that child? Where did it go? And so it was a bigger journey that's led me to a smaller journey that's led me back to myself, which in leading me back to myself, I now know that I can show others how to do this so that we don't all have to suffer and just be miserable and we can get out of survival mode and get into thriving mode. That's what we're all meant to do is thrive, not survive. So in your classes, and you conduct classes several days a week, right? Mm -hmm. In the yoga classes, yeah. yes. And uh, I do workshops too. Well, I started to say that there's, there's quite a bit of teaching besides just going in and doing a yoga movement or... A, well, only if you want to go into the intellectual aspect of it. You can just come to a yoga class and experience it, and you know, you feel it the first time. If you want to learn how to do it and become a stress a yoga teacher, you come to workshops, you turn, come to training. We train people how to do stress a yoga, so um, we train teachers how to do stress a yoga so they can teach others. This needs to grow and get out in the world. Um, it's such an amazing process. In fact, I've got a workshop coming up um, September 21st. It's a two-hour workshop in Germantown. And it's from 2 to 4 on Saturday. And it's only 30 bucks. So you can come and get, get some more in-depth information if that's what you'd like so to do. So that's where you get the intellectual train before the, mm -hmm. uh, the movement. Well, most people answer. that will come to a workshop will have, I, I refer to it like catching, they will have caught it like catching the measles almost. It has to catch you. You have to experience it uh, before you want to know about it. It's, it's like this inner knowing that happens when you get something like, oh, you feel it in your body. You know that that's something that's real. It's like the saying, the mind once it's expanded can never be contracted. Once you get that little bit of light in there, you just got to know more. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Well, um, we can all mess ourselves up pretty bad. <laughs> so I'm not sure all minds that have expanded have not contracted some, but uh, we, we hope that we strive for expansion, yes. Yeah, just like the universe moving to expansion and contraction and day and night, and dark and light. So where do you go from here? You've got the books, you've got the classes, mm -hmm. you've, you've developed uh, stress ace yoga. Mm -hmm. What do you see for Dr. L now? I'm go I am um, teaching and training on an international level stress ace yoga and uh, I want to get teachers out there that can help people and have their own classes and um, I have an associate in Australia that's uh, working with me. She was originally one of my I to make technology students, and she's taken the work, and she's doing it in Australia. So I'm hoping to do that now here in the States. And uh, in this yoga, we don't use um, Sanskrit terms. Um, we work with uh, infant reflexes. We do postures. We do sound, and we do breath. So it's not. There's a lot of things that are still mysterious in the world, and it's not about taking the mystery out of yoga. But it's more like recognizing what works, and then what's kind of doesn't work. The um, period now, we've, we've come a little bit uh, 
close to our closing or in the last part of it. Are there any questions that anybody would like to ask of Dr. L? I have one. Okay. You had made mention of the basic brain at birth, and I had a, a vision of what I call genetic history, which is akin to traits behavior patterns and things that are passed from our ancestors and it's connected with libations and things that is that's within the, basically the African culture but I didn't hear that that particular aspect of it in terms of is that something that you reach to help your clients uh, reach their inner self to get into their genetic history that's painful. Great question. That's a really great question. Here's my take on that. Um, within that sperm and egg and genetics that we inherit, our DNA, whether you believe in past lives and you don't, I don't, you know, it's, it doesn't matter at this point. What matters is that we do inherit. And I do feel I had the, the sickness of calling of the ancestors, and that was another reason for me to take that journey. If I had never taken that journey, I would not understand and could not relate to the patterns that I had inherited. Many of us feel a certain way and we don't know why. Or we like the color blue. I mean, why do I like the color blue? Those kind of things come down through our DNA and our genetics from our ancestors. And our ancestors don't just go back. I mean, I hope I'm not stepping on anyone's toes here, seven generations. They go back thousands and millions of years. We carry the DNA and those genetics. There's a um, something you can actually send off in National Geographic. It's at nationalgeographic.com, and you click on Genographics, and you can take a swab of your own DNA, and you can send it off to them. And they will, they will be able to look at your DNA and your, your genetics and tell you where your original ancestors came from on the planet. I've done that. My ancestors come from Ethiopia. Another friend of mine did it, and his ancestors came from Kenya. But my ancestors, which is really interesting, is they seem to have migrated straight up to the north. Some peoples went over to Russia. Some went straight, some went to the left, over to Sweden and Europe. And so knowing these kinds of things now, we can see where environment and culture and weather patterns that have changed over the earth for millions of years have shifted us from, for instance, um, in the cold north, there's not a lot of sun. So our noses are more narrow and our skin is more white. In the heat, uh, where there's a lot of sun, you need to breathe more and get more air. In the north, you want to stay warm. So the nostrils get more narrow and, that, and the, uh, the skin gets darker, like getting a tan. So we all come from the original ancestors. And that's been a real amazing experience um, while my journey in Africa. We danced the ancestors, we sang the ancestors, my ancestors became my friends. Where before, because, going back to my original statement, because I came from such a dysfunctional family, I could never relate to them. So I went on this journey of, okay, if I can't relate to these people, who can I relate to? I can relate to my ancestors very clearly and very easily. And that's when I'm getting goosebumps now. I finally got a sense of belonging on this planet. Because there's like a gap I had missed. I had missed that gap. Um, you know, and I've grown and I've changed and um, that's the way my journey has been. So I'm wanting to share that and share the, not only the mystical parts and the mystery, 
but also the scientific basis of the quantum physics and the anatomy and the physiology. It all works together. It's the web of life, the life that we live, all of us live, even though a lot of us think we're separate or different. We all live this web of life. Absolutely. Are they another question? Anything you want, you got her here. You manifested her here. <laughs> <laughs> Better make use of it. Mm -hmm. And that was September the what date for your next workshop? September the twenty first in Germantown. Uh, space is limited. There's only I'm only going to take um, five people at this time, and uh, I'm not in a big hurry. Although I know it's really important, I want to do it slowly and I want to do it properly. Is this at Rhonda Manning's place? It's at uh, a place called MFR Yoga, 2075 uh, Germantown Parkway. Okay. I know where that is. And the owner was a co-worker of mine. Okay. Grace? Grace. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, what is the... Um, um, it's actually a physical therapy um, yeah. office. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, would you like to go ahead and give the viewers your web address and how to contact you as well? Sure. Regardless of where they are. Right. Um, I have two. I have allaboutyoga.org and then I have stressaceyoga.com. Stress the word stress ace, we know what stress is. Ace is like when you ace a test, you know. Um, stress ace yoga is yoga for the 21st century and it's for the Western mind. And uh, it's a natural way that we all can learn to release stress on a conscious level, and um, it's natural stress control. We all already know how to do it. We just don't know how to organize it. In uh, a lot of people have trouble recognizing that they even are under stress. You know how we push ourselves through pain. You know, maybe we are not sleeping properly, or maybe we're not breathing properly. Well, all this has to do with stress, how we eat, um, how we interact with others. It's all very, very interrelated. And the three things were breath, sound, sound and movement. Breath, sound, and movement. And you get all of that with stress age yoga. Mm -hmm. Well, you get it with any yoga. You just don't know what you're doing with it. I mean, you know, you do the postures, you do the breath, you hold, that sort of thing. And it does work to release stress, but if you stop doing the yoga, it'll come back. The pains will come back and that sort of thing. That's what I learned in my journey as well. But with stress ice, it's a permanent release. Once you get back to your authentic self, you're good to go. One last question. Anyone? I want to thank you very much, You're very welcome. Dr. L, for being with us today. I enjoyed it. And uh, I didn't know I could talk that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just let you go. Just I let you do it. <laughs> I'm not a very big talker. So. <laughs> no, that's very good, and it's very interesting, and, and I'm very pleased to have had you with us. Thank you. I want to remind viewers, if you're watching this uh, session anywhere else but uh, on YouTube, that you can see all of the Core Concepts lecture series by going to youtube.com, typing in Renford, R-E-N-F-O-R-D, Broadcast Network, and then you can see those, all of the Core Concepts lectures, the Bookman shows, the Laws of Material Wealth Personal Development Program, the audio books, Music with Meaning, and you can find movies there that you may not know. You, you may have heard of The Secret or you may have heard of uh, What the Bleep or Revive or other movies. And you can find the link all there in the Renfrew Theater. So I want to invite you to do that. I want to invite you also to visit the virtual campus of the Institute of Applied Metaphysics. That's at www.iam-cor.org. iam-cor.org. All of the 
three degree levels are present there with the books, the courses, and so forth. You can see them all. You can visit the bookstore. There's a synopsis of each of the books, the Redford books. And also there are three free e-books that you can download there. You can download the core document, uh, the searcher's roadmap, and the unity principles. And you can also download the Lightways easing electronic magazine uh, is there as well. So I want to invite you to do that. And also to check out blogtalkradio.com. That's www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Renford. We have talk shows every single day. And we want to welcome you to come and check that out. They're all archived there. And, of course, we hope that you'll come back and be with us next week on Core Concepts.